Good. Thanks very much, uh, Christine. If, if a parent asks me any time, uh, who would I recommend as a driver trainer or what driving school would I recommend, I have two suggestions. The first one is ask if you can sit in the back seat of the car while they take your son or daughter uh, on their training runs. Number two, ask them to have a look at their curriculum. So if they can't produce a curriculum that says this is what we're going to do as far as a training regime, then go and look somewhere else. But they're my two uh, starting points in relation to driver training. First of all, I'd like to commend Natalie and Cars Q in the progress and process in the higher order skills. So I'm coming from higher order skills, but from a different direction. So I support fully uh, what Natalie has presented and I'd implore you, if you want to find out more about uh, some critical issues, go and have a look at her research and you can uh, follow through and see some of the issues because uh, she's done it all in Queensland in relation to asking the driver trainers, asking the learner drivers, asking that. So she's got the research to back up the qualifications that she's put forward. So looking at the presentation today, uh, what I'd like to just run through quickly is the background, the international perspective, uh, problem analysis, what's the situation here, what is the critical role of the driver trainer, and the seven point plan for enhanced uh, professionalism. This is what we're on about, professionalism in the industry and raising the status of driver trainers across the nation and focus on improvements and uh, resolutions. So you've all seen these uh, graphs and they're pretty horrendous uh, when you look at them. The one on the left is the Victorian one. You saw one before in relation to New South Wales, the L to P's. It's the same internationally. You can look in America, you can look in the in United Kingdom, look in Germany, the graphs are the same internationally. And it's an indictment on our system when we say to the uh, young driver, Okay, son or daughter, here's your licence, congratulations. Oh, by the way, do you realise in the next six months you've got a 30% chance of crashing? And that may be fatal. So would you go into an operation if you had that risk involved? And this is what we, as a community, as a nationality, we're putting that to our young people. But we don't tell them that. We don't go through the, the end result of what the outcome is. Uh, somebody asked before on the issues uh, of the, the tails, either side of the, uh, the graph in terms of learner drivers or young people. Uh, the graph on the right hand side uh, demonstrates critically uh, what the issues are from 0 to 18 uh, and from 18 to 99. So you see it's, uh, it, it raises its, its head, its ugly head at 17, 18, 19, they're all our fatalities. You can actually check the injury rate. They mirror the same situation right across Australia and in every state. So, uh, and day after day, we hear of the critical risks that people are involved with in terms of uh, their crash risk and crash rates. So look at the international situation. So we'll go from international to local and it's really a global epi epidemic. We've got 95% of crashes are caused by human behaviour. We call them errors. I don't see that they're errors when you have drink driving, distractions, uh, overloading, speeding, etc., etc. They're all premeditated and all can be avoided if we run through the uh, proper process. So this is our starting point. How can we move forward? So we have all these fantastic graphs that towards zero, uh, towards uh, 50, we've had uh, 2011 to 2020, the decade of action, we wanted to halve the road toll. We said we'd halve it in uh, 10 years, we haven't done it. Now we've made another promise, we're gonna halve it again by 2030, or we're gonna get to zero by uh, 2050. So what are we doing about it? Our focus, from your perspective, is we want to get safer people. That safer drivers, safer road users across the board. So what are the common observations on our road network? 
And you know, it wouldn't matter which state we're in, whether we talk about Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, wherever. Uh, tailgating, bullying, uh, speed, alcohol, drugs, fatigue, distractions, texting, diverging when unsafe, uh, running red lights, stopping, failing to stop at giveaways and stop signs, ignorance about roundabouts, who's got right away when you're merging, all these issues and we talk about confidence and competence, competencies, and we'll strengthen that issue of competencies because that's our total focus. And we talk about high-risk behaviours and uh, peer influences. The question I ask is, are these issues all part of the driver training regime? Is this what you're training in when you're taking your learner drivers through the system? If not, why not? So let's do a reality check. We know that 80 to 95% of crashes are caused by high risk or illegal behaviours. What are we doing about it? We talk about human error. Everybody wants to excuse it as human error. As I said before, it's not a human error to be uh, driving alcohol impaired or drug impaired. That's a premeditated action. And the driving licence is the cornerstone to the whole system. This is our, uh, what we're talking about is the training delivery, the method of training. Natalie talked about higher order instruction. I'll talk about coaching as the, the focus. And, and they're both basically the same thing, but coming at it from a different direction. My remedy is you don't tinker around the edges. You go for the heart of the problem. And that's driver competencies at all levels. Skills, behaviour and the driving culture. So the foundation of our whole safe systems approach is the driver. We don't appreciate that, but we, if you look at it constructively, it's the foundation of our whole system. Our learner drivers become our fleet drivers, they become our transport drivers, our commercial drivers our industry, our private drivers. Our learner drivers then become our taxis, our emergency services, our tradies. Our drivers become our parents and then they teach the young kids and they become driver trainers and the cycle continues. So if you, if you look at the gold standard at the heart of the problem, the foundation, which is a driver training system, you then impact upon the whole regime of the system. Instead of tinkering around the edges all the way across the board, then you just focus on what it is to uh, present uh, the system as a driver training upgrade in the whole system. Okay, you aim for continuous improvement and gold standard across the board. So what I'd like you to think about is professionalism in the driver training industry. What is it? What does it mean? What's it professional? I've been fortunate enough to go international and look at a few places and do some reviews in driver training. One was Dubai and I went there and uh, I was having an initial discussion with uh, Vic Rhodes and talking to the, the boss man there. And he said, oh, that's great. He said, can you do a presentation to my trainers? And I said, oh, yeah, when? Expecting in a couple of days. He said, no, I'll do it in an hour's time. And he rustled up 100 trainers just like that and said, I want you to talk for an hour, okay? And that was just Dubai with their system and I'll show you a video shortly of Dubai. Doing it also in India, Cambodia, Indonesia and a few other countries. But you're looking at the different systems and then comparing it to Australia. So this is Dubai. Within Dubai's busy street scene on the jetties and wharfs lies evidence of a major success story. Drivers who've trained and achieved driving competence with Emirates. Emirates Driving Institute has in excess of 500 training vehicles this of all types. This is 15 types, years ago. Including cars, trucks, buses, forklift trucks, industrial shovels, motorcycles, and has around the same number of instructors, both male and female, who between them speak around 20 immediately struck by the activity level. 
every day over 3,500 students come for their classes, and potential students visit the institute to join up. For the students to obtain their student driving license, the institute staff process their applications and ensure all the documentation are in order, including photographs and items in the yard. The student is trained on the internal roads, junctions, parking lots, and corners, enabling them to take control of the vehicle in a protected environment. Again, building their confidence in vehicle management. Before they progress to street driving, students are required to pass the internal parking test. Students are then taken around the local roads initially and are gradually introduced to more congested traffic conditions, including roundabouts and traffic signals. The Institute's vehicles are a familiar sight on the roads in Dubai, particularly since it now has vehicles stationed in a number of suburbs in addition to near its head office. So the next one's India, Providing sitting in the back with support of the car. services features highly on the... They've got to help them drive. A good way to teach people how to drive. The next one is uh, doing a three-point turn in the middle of a crowded street. So, oh, you've got to watch out for cows. Uh, good to do a three-point drive, three-point turn. Great confidence building for the student. Move to sitting in the back seat of a car in Cambodia, where the instructor's uh, firing off directions in all, all ways. You might not have the voiceover, but he's constantly telling her what to do and helping a drive as well. Okay. okay, so they're just three examples internationally. What I'd like you to do is just think about the perspective as what is good practice. So, okay, Dubai's got uh, one of the best systems and fleets in the world. Yeah, great. What's their fatality and injury rate? Half the population of New South Wales, half the population of Victoria, and, and twice the fatality rate still 15 years later. So uh, when I was there with Vic Rhodes, all they wanted was glossy books, glossy manuals. So they could put it on the table as a coffee table book and say, look what we've got. And they've got all the fleet there, they've got two-way communication, whole system. They won't let their learner drivers on the freeways while they're learning. So as soon as the learner driver gets their licence, out in the main drag, on the freeways with 120, 160 kilometre uh, traffic and what happens? India, death rate 150,000 or 80,000, just depends which uh, source you go to. Cambodia, you can guarantee four or five um, deaths every day of the year. So population 13 million. So just some little issues to think about when people think, oh yeah, we've got best practice or good practice and what does it really mean? What are the outcomes? That's what we're looking for. So we then look at running towards the basic education and awareness programs. So we know that education and awareness are the foundation of road safety. And people poo-hoo the idea and, yeah, you can have these brochures or read the books or whatever. Effective driver training. This is transferring your knowledge and skills and behavioural issues to the learner driver. It's a transfer of information, it's a transfer of experience, a transfer of skills. Bear in mind, it takes the same time to train a driver badly 
as it does to try and drive it safely. So is the graduated licensing system the answer? So we give people their probationary licence and then we see where it goes in the, the graphs. It's a universal admittance to the safe systems. The driver licensing system is there in the safe systems approach. This is your entry into the system. And then we apply all sorts of restrictions in different uh, states, passenger limits, nighttime curfews, vehicle power restrictions, alcohol and mobile restrictions, performance metrics are usually based on hours. And as Natalie said, and somebody asked the question, 120 hours in Victoria and New South Wales, 110 in Queensland. You can do buybacks if you want to. South Australia, 75, Tassie, 80. Western Australia, 50, Northern Territory, nothing. Every one of those jurisdictions has done a, a research project and said this is the best one and we'll stick with it as far as we go. So is it the right answer? Is it being appropriately addressed? And one of the critical issues, we've still got the six months uh, crash rate is the highest around Australia. So an unstructured approach to learning. If we look at everything that uh, you people do in terms of your learning regime, it's probably different in every driving school and yet it all complies with the, uh, the state's requirements and it's different in Victoria, different in Queensland. So what have we learnt? And we've had the GLS round now for 20 years or more. So let's continue on and how can we uh, move forward? So a seven point plan, and this is what we're presenting, just as a, a way forward. And you can't do everything at once, but you need to look at the issues and uh, do what you can at the time. We say competency-based education and training, that should be the foundation. Understand the process of learning. Driving is a life skill, so it should have a appropriate learning regime that attaches to it. And we prefer the name graduated education and learning. Understanding the learning styles of students. Everybody's different, artist, engineer, uh, everybody's got a different characteristic in their learning style. So the, the trainers must be able to understand that learning style and work accordingly. We need to focus on a coaching approach, which is a different approach to tell, listen and obey. Have a standard written curriculum, and that should be produced by the state, not individually by uh, each driving school, but in the absence of some written curriculum from the state, we're suggesting that each uh, school has their own. So at least you know where you're going. And uh, then work on uh, the issue with its uh, according to the curriculum. So the seven point plan there uh, talks about accountability, uh, measuring su success against zero, not against 2% improvement on last year, but against zero fatalities and have an accountability framework. So <coughs> the quality-based learning and engagement, just a summary. We, we concentrate on competency-based education and training to understand the process of learning, and Natalie talked a lot about that, how, how do people learn? What makes it stick in their brain? So understanding the styles of students and focus on coaching. So the safety philosophy and ethos. The primary focus is always safety. It's the overarching principle of everything. It should be in all your documentation on your website, safety, safety, safety. Marketing, whatever you do, a safety focus, that's the outcome you want from actions, learning, activities. Acknowledge the decade of action. That's the international standard. We're looking at uh, reducing road fatalities by 50% by 2030. Talk to the students about that and let them understand what it's all about reducing road trauma and uh, acknowledging the towards zero focus of 2050. Okay, I concentrate particularly on the issue of respect on our roads. Respect for yourself, respect for your passengers, respect for road users and respect for the law. 
and we have an RESPCT process, risk assessment, experience, etc. Safety going through it, but this is something that uh, you can reinforce with the students as you go through the system. But once they develop this ethos, then it's there for life. They'll remember what they're taught in the uh, training regime. Okay, some minimum standards and documentation. So we need quality manuals. We need those that are, uh, include your mission, your values, your statement of uh, code of contact. Do you have a risk management strategy? Have you got a strategic plan? Is there a feedback loop to your whole process? You've got a complaint system, an audit process, accountability and responsibility. These are all key issues and you need to develop and then your association can start to, to assist in those if you haven't got them. If you've got them, that's great. It's uh, uh, looking at quality, integrity and credibility of the whole organisation. You're trying to raise the status of the driver training system. Okay, minimum standards continued. I talked to uh, some of the driver trainers and I say, do you conform to ISO 3901? Uh, what's that? Oh, okay. Well, nine specific issues that talk about trainers and educators within that system and they apply equally at grassroots level to they do as they do to the international standards. So it's based on the systems approach and it's part of the safe systems approach that we need to understand. You don't have to tow it to the letter or tow the line to the letter, but it need, at least if you're conforming with the general theme of it, uh, then it puts you in good stead. So road users and uh, trainers and educators play a vital role in developing safe and responsible road users and as such, we should aim for compliance at all levels. So we go forward to quality learning and engagement. And this is about competency-based outcomes, competency-based training, to understand the process of learning and to appreciate that driving is a life skill. It's not just getting your licence and uh, go for it, out to nightclubs and taking your mates out and all this sort of thing. It's there for life. I still remember 50 or 60 years ago when I did my licence and you remember those driving skills and this is what you want when people are going through the system now. They know the system of car control, they know all the other things and they do it automatically. Understanding the learning style of students and the written standard, uh, written curriculum. The professional image, that's a start, the uniforms. You know, the pedals, the mirrors, the whole system so that you've got control, the branding, and all your trainers and uh, educators qualified, and your vehicle fit out, and example setting. So the, these are part of the whole system, and often uh, I, I see people doing their uh, training around our location, and that they'll be speeding, and you say, how come they're speeding? They've got to, you know a trainer beside them. Well, why are they speeding? It's not good. But you see all sorts of other issues which you no doubt have seen as well. Okay, so the professional image of the quality of trainers. So Natalie also spoke about the psychology and this is something that's uh, severely lacking across Australia. And it's understanding that. It's lacking in the road safety system. We've got very few people in psychology that it imp impact at a national level that work on the, the issue of road safety. It's all about engineering, it's about uh, cars and, and roads and that sort of thing, and very little about human behaviour. Multi-billions of dollars by federal and state governments put into the system to build new roads, but very few about enforcement and education and training regimes. And you'd be interested to know it wasn't even mentioned and still not mentioned in the 10-year uh, plan with the National Road Safety Strategy. Notwithstanding the fact we pushed for it in the first instant, it doesn't rate a mention it, as far as uh, the system. OK, so we need to transition from a training style to a coaching and learning style. And this is about self-evaluation. 
self-evaluation from the trainer's point of view, self-evaluation from the student's point of view. Am I passionate as a trainer about road safety? Do I want to contribute to saving lives? If the answer is yes, go for it. Am I capable, competent and confident in understanding the learner personality styles? Okay, we move on to the training delivery. My focus is particularly on coaching as a training philosophy. It's proven with the research internationally that training is a great way of making that message stick. You're getting the client to self-evaluate, self-calibrate, work out their own system to be able to have self-control of the whole system and not just tell, listen and obey. Do as they're told till they get their licence and then you're on your own. Sorry about that. So you're building a relationship with the client, a relationship of trust. You're understanding the process of driving and you're demonstrating the process at all the time. And it was mentioned before of doing that commentary drive. What do you see up ahead? You'd be amazed that the students are often only looking 50 metres ahead. Hazard perceptions, oh yeah, you've got to do hazard perceptions. But if you're looking far enough ahead or running a 360 uh, environmental scan all the time, you don't have hazards because you see something that could happen and you avoid the, the happening. And it's not a hazard, you just drive along as normally. And we do it all to automatically because you've been driving for years, you know to avoid those sort of issues. But the young people don't, they're looking for hazards, the kid running out of the school crossing or whatever. Right? And they forget that somebody putting on their brakes 300 metres up on a freeway is a hazard as much as uh, the, the young kid that you don't see dashing out before between the cars. You're getting the client to rational thinking and understanding and guiding them to self-assessment. It's all about them, self-assessment. It's not about the trainer. It's about what the student learns by the time they finish their training. Motivating, encouraging giving them feedback and seeking feedback and being non-judgmental. Assessment and self-assessment. It's not the tell, listen and obey as a constant process. So we've had, we've had to tell, listen and obey for the last 50 years. We need to develop the same system as a sport. The coach is not out there constantly in the ears of the football or rugby players saying, hey, do this, do that. They've taken them through the coaching process and they're on their own now. So we need to de develop a safe process for every road user interaction. So you can drive unsafely on, you can drive unsafely on a safe road. Take a look at all the crashes on the Hume Freeway, five-star road, five-star cars, fatalities quite frequently. So what's missing? the five-star driver. We need to understand, or they need to understand, the speed, distance and manage both. Manage road safety in a 360 environment. The learner driver needs to be performance-based outcomes. That's both for the learner and for the driver training, for the coach. Can I get the next video okay to go, thanks? The learner. Uh, at this stage, the, the day before their license you test. You make sure that there's no vehicles on the right. And you've got to look both ways for trams. Now if it's all clear, and there's no other vehicles turning in that are using tram lights, you can proceed in on a 45 degree angle, making sure that you position the whole vehicle in, right? Even though there could be cars coming from the left side, we can position ourselves momentarily so we can attempt to turn safely when the next available gap approaches. <clears throat> okay, so when you position yourself, first thing you need to remember is to get the whole vehicle in the tram lines, right? And you've got to look both ways for trams. If there are trams coming, you wait here. Yeah. If there's no trams coming, you move in. They're when you can't see the yellow line tomorrow. of the full-time tram reserve, and that's what it is, um, when you can't see the yellow line in front of the vehicle, that means you can approach a little bit further and stop. You've got about a metre and a half or so. Alright, yeah. once you stop safely within the tram line, that means that you're not impeding the other car behind you, you're on a 45 degree angle, and once it's clear of vehicles, you take the first available gap and complete your turn. Okay, I'm going to guide you through it. Yeah. You ready?
Okay, yeah. When you're ready. Put on the brakes, wait for us. That was a short recording from a well-regarded driving instructor creating a passive consumer environment which is not learning, it's actually listening. The instructor delivered 210 pieces of information in 8.4 minutes if you watch the entire video. A crash causality is that we are not training active participants of a system. Instructor is using a whiteboard with squiggles and wiggles on it, which is simulation. And another name for simulation is fake. What we know is the human brain does not transfer fake into reality, because if it were true, you could learn to drive a car by reading a book or watching a video. And whilst they help in some aspects, fake does not transfer into reality. As a coach, I need to confirm that learnt has been learned and I have transferred knowledge. With the client just merely nodding and making occasional noises, there is no confirmation at all that learnt is being transferred and yet he continues to provide an abundance of information. Even when he says, let's go, he starts telling what, how, when, why to then drive the car. Yet the client is apparently just before a license test or solo independent driving. The training and process for each road user interaction should involve getting out of the car. Can you imagine learning to play a sport having never watched the sport? It makes it very difficult to get a top-down view of how that interaction is working. There is a significant amount of research into coaching and how it's applied, how it's measured, and then how it would be enacted in the driving scene. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Can I prove what I'm talking about? And uh, what I'd like to do is just show you a graph which is comparative statistics in Victoria. Uh, and it uh, looks at 10 years uh, under the system with the general uh, fatalities of uh, 1,489 driver fatalities and the Victorian 18 and 20 year olds during that same period, 2007 to 2017. And a survey of 1,800 of those that have been coached, purely coached, and checking their results at the six month period. Uh, so it's 180 per year. Uh, for the 10 years and zero crashes uh, and looking also, somebody raised the issue about um, uh, fines or infringements and that sort of thing. It's all relative, fines uh, and near misses, etc. So you can do comparative studies that actually show that there is uh, value in coaching that uh, does work. Uh, okay, accountability for the learner pre and post licence and how do you measure success? You need to monitor at least the first 12 months afterwards and this is great for uh, every driver training organisation. You should be doing it at six months if you're going and 12 months and it's, it's great for business as well because you're sending out a note saying how are you going by the way, have you had any crashes, any fines etc. So you do an automatic survey of your clientele, uh, how are your mates going so you might get more business or whatever. Do it again on their birthday. Congratulations, you're 19 now or whatever the age uh, is after 12 months. And you follow through. It's a, it's a good business activity, but it's also measuring success against zero crashes. And if you're not getting zero crashes, then you need to sharpen what you're doing in your training focus. So encourage the safe driver pledge. Many organisations in New South Wales get the young people to say, you know, I, I pledge to uh, sign in an envelope, I pledge to drive safely and look after my mates and all that sort of thing. So there's dozens of ways that you can uh, uh, 
run through the system. So, and lastly, the accreditation framework for continuous improvement. This is building the status of your organisation, uh, state-based and nationally, uh, to get the improvement in the whole system. You need to look at the what's in it for me system as driver trainers as well as the individual students. Okay, higher workload because you get a greater reputation, uh, you can build on that. Better financial returns and the contractors earn more. Uh, your speaker this morning was talking about NDIS, which we've uh, into with audit focus and that sort of thing. So there's a higher return on investment, but it requires a greater level of professionalism. And clients enjoy the process, the learning experience, because you're running them through the whole system as a, uh, a learning experience and they know when they graduate that they are not only confident, which most of them are, but they're competent, competent for life. Okay, and just a bit of a promo. Uh, we've got a system in Cambodia. We've got a couple of young uh, Cambodian uh, peer influencers across in Australia. We sponsored them on a scholarship to uh, run them through the driver training system, uh, driver coaching system. We've put them through the Cert 4 and they've gone through that with flying colours uh, as uh, driver trainers. And now we're running through the system of uh, coaching regime to get through uh, and take that back to Cambodia. Uh, what we can do back there is anybody's guess at this stage, it's an open-ended uh, process, but we've just sparked the influence um, uh, and that's something we think uh, we're very proud of, but they're currently doing a six-week uh, coaching program here in Australia. So achieving professionalism, just by way of summary, driver licensing is the cornerstone of the safe systems approach and we should be focusing on that at all times. We need to coach in a live and dynamic environment, on road and real circumstances. You need standards and accreditation at all levels. You need to assess competencies against the curriculum and you measure performance against zero harm. Okay, so I'll leave that for you to look at the various issues, uh, think about the issues and uh, look at it as a future direction, but I'd encourage you to, in, to enshrine the issues of the higher order uh, information that Natalie was talking about and think about it as a total package, not just a uh, one-stop shop or uh, something that you can uh, just do as a quick fix. It takes a long time to work through and uh, it's something that uh, we'd be very proud of uh, once the professionalism is raised across the nation. Thank you all. Are there any 